Hi, this is Dale Rota with Biostat Global Consulting. I want to take a few minutes today to revisit a topic that we discussed briefly many weeks ago at the start of the Survey Scholar course. You'll recall that when we were calculating sample sizes, we mentioned that surveys can have different goals. The goal of most vaccination coverage surveys is to estimate vaccination coverage. We calculate a point estimate and a two-sided 95% confidence interval, and that's what we report to the world. But we mentioned at that time that sometimes the goal is to classify coverage, and that to do so, we first estimate coverage, and we use the estim estimation results to classify coverage, and that's the topic I want to revisit today. Now we've been through module A3, we've all estimated some results, we've looked at two-sided confidence intervals, we have looked at inchworm plots in a recent video, and so I want to tie these concepts together. Here's an inchworm plot, and we're just going to review the three statements that we sometimes make about 95% confidence. We are 95% confident that coverage falls somewhere within the two-sided confidence interval. We are also 95% confident that coverage falls somewhere above the one-sided lower bound. And we are 95% confident that coverage falls somewhere below the one-sided upper bound. The two-sided interval is the main output when we estimate coverage, and the one-sided bounds are the outputs that we use for classifying coverage, and that we include them in the inchworm plot with the ticks shown here. Here's an inchworm plot with coverage that's been estimated for quite a few districts. You see each of the districts has a sample size of 150, and when the districts are aggregated together for province level coverage, the sample size is 3,600. And you can see the two-sided confidence intervals, and you see the one-sided tick marks. This figure also shows uh, the SIA target. The target was to vaccinate 95% or more of the eligible kids here, and so that's indicated with the red line. So the shapes represent our confidence about coverage for each stratum. And now if we think about classifying coverage, we could do it in several ways. And so the following figures will show the same shapes here, but we'll co color them differently depending on our classification scheme. In the first scheme, we use the point estimate to classify. So we say if the point estimate is above 95%, we say congratulations to that district, and we classify them as pass, and we color them green. And if the point estimate is below 95%, we color them red and we tell them that they failed to reach the target. This is a logical and simple classification rule. It's very likely to make a lot of classification errors for strata where the estimated coverage is very near the decision threshold. So it's quite possible that some strata will have had true coverage a little below 95%. But in the sample, the sample coverage will be a little above 95. And vice versa, it's quite likely that some strata will have true coverage a little bit above 95%, but their sample coverage will be slightly below 95%. And so there will be a high probability of classification errors when the, when the true coverage is near the decision threshold. In fact, the probability of classification error is roughly 50% when that's the case. So it's simple, but it makes a lot of errors. The next rule says, let's use the lower bound to classify. Here, we're going to say you pass if the one-sided bound is at 95% or above. In this case, we see that fewer straight a pass, but we're very confident about those classifications. We're very unlikely to have a false pass here, but we're quite likely to have a false fail when coverage is near 95%. So it may very well be true that these strata where the point estimates are above 95%, that their true coverage is above 95%, but we, we, we classify them as fail here. So this rule generates very few false passes, but it generates quite a few false fails when coverage is near the threshold. So it has one strong conclusion, pass is a strong conclusion here, and fail can be quite a weak conclusion here. So it's a, the, the strength of the inference is lopsided. This next rule is the complement to that, and this one is also lopsided. Here we say we're going to use the upper confidence bound for classifying. 
If the upper confidence bound is below the threshold, then we're going to fail the stratum and color it red. And otherwise, we're going to pass it and color it green. Well, you see here that failing is a strong conclusion. We're very likely to falsely say fail here because we are 95% confident that they failed. But we may very well be falsely passing some clusters. Cluster N comes to mind. It looks very much like this failed, but we classify it as a pass. And so this is a decision rule that also has one strong conclusion and one weak conclusion. The next slide shows my favorite classification rule because it provides two strong conclusions. We're going to use both the upper and the lower bounds here to classify. If the lower bound, in fact, if, uh, uh, if both bounds are above the threshold, then we classify it as a pass. If both bounds are below the threshold, then we classify it as a fail. And if the one-sided confidence bounds straddle, or we could say contain, the decision threshold, then we use a third classification. We say that the classification is indeterminate. We do not have a large enough sample size in these strata to conclude with 95% confidence that coverage is either above or below the threshold. In this case, passing is a strong conclusion, failing is a strong conclusion, and to be quite honest, classifying as intermediate is also a strong conclusion. It's, it's the, it, it just is the case that you need a very, very large sample to confidently classify when the true coverage is very near the decision threshold. So personally, I like this classification rule the best because it's very clear and it doesn't have any weak conclusions and it doesn't have any conclusions that are misleading. Now that being said, some decision makers do not care for this rule because they think, hey, I just spent a lot of money to do a coverage survey and you're telling me that you can't give me a pass or a fail for these strata? How many strata do we have here? Three, six, nine. There are 10 strata here that you've not classified as pass or fail. Why did I spend all that money if you can't give me a good answer? So some people find this rule to be less satisfying than I do. I find it to be satisfying because it's so clear. It's not misleading. The bottom line is that in your survey, you can classify however you like. But please, for the sake of your readers and for the sake of the people who will make decisions with your classifications, be very clear about what method you use to classify. And if that method has a high likelihood of making one kind of classification error or the other kind, or if it has a high likelihood of making both kinds of classification error when true coverage is near the decision threshold, then please be clear about that when you write it up. I hope this has been helpful. This is a topic that I feel uh, uh, I'm passionate about. So if you have questions or comments, please leave them here in the Scholar Update window and we, we can talk about them as a community and if you're finding this video after the scholar course has closed or you're finding it via some other route then please feel free to send me an email and I'd love to discuss this more with you. Thanks very much.